All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on kind of a dreary Thursday. Uh, we appreciate you all being here. Um, I'm George Trammell. I'm uh, just a recent graduate of Boston University. So is Max here, actually. Um, and I'm pursuing a master's here. Uh, Max, if you want to yeah, say hi. Max Karambolis. I'm a recent graduate from BU. Got a Bachelor of Science in Data Science. And I'm currently a PM over at USAA. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be talking about kind of, this is a bit of a long and advanced title. We'll kind of break it down as we go. Um, but uh, kind of a generative AI tool um, for Terraform, which some of you may know about. Um, if not, we'll explain a bunch of things here. Um, this is kind of our session plan on the right. Uh, we'll have kind of a live demonstration of kind of the tool we built, how it works. We'll go through some of the technology of it. We'll talk about kind of the ways it could be adapted for other things. Um, and then just some Q&A at the end. Um, this is our first time speaking at like a conference or anything, so we're excited to do it. Um, and if there's like any, you know, we, we've kind of spent so much time on this project amongst ourselves that some of the ways we explain things only make sense to us at this point. Um, so if there's any like acronyms we kind of forgot to define or anything that you want us to kind of help with, um, feel free to just raise a hand and ask us whenever. Um, but. Uh, essentially, um, we're here because uh, it might not surprise you that as students, uh, we basically asked ChatGPT to try to do our homework. Um, and uh, it wasn't just uh, any homework. It was specifically a homework for a cloud development class, kind of like an intro cloud development class. Um, and the homework specifically was, it was super simple, just like intro stuff. It was basically like create a web server VM and connect it to a SQL database and just have them speak a little bit. That, that's it. That's all. Uh, in Google Cloud specifically, but um, that was just kind of super basic setup stuff to get us uh, kind of learning how the pieces work. Um, and this was about a year ago. Um, and uh, something fun that they actually did for this class is that uh, we had $200 of kind of homework credit at the beginning of the semester before we started. Um, and that was our like cloud credit. And if we ran out of that before the semester was over trying to do our homework, we simply couldn't do our homework. So we'd get zeros for the rest of the semester. Uh, so there was a lot of incentive for us to kind of get this right, uh, even from the beginning. Um, so of course, uh, ChatGPT was all the rage then, as it still sort of is now for homework and things along those lines. So we figured we'd try it out. Um, essentially, we pretty quickly learned that it really kind of didn't do a good job, which was surprising to us uh, because this seems like a task it should be pretty good at. It's code generation. There's a ton of cloud documentation on the internet. It seems like it should do an OK job. Um, but it actually did things like straight up fabricate code. Um, it would uh, just add things that you know obviously didn't need to be there. It would uh, leave out crucial components like zoning components for cloud, which is just like r seemingly ridiculous because like I don't understand how a model like ChatGPT could leave out a zoning component for um, cloud development. It seems like that would be included in just about everything. Um, and even when it got close to what we wanted it to do, which was literally just that homework of connecting a web server VM to a SQL database, it didn't follow best practices and it was super inefficient on pricing. Like all we needed to accomplish this homework was uh, really cheap like the cheapest uh, web server or the cheapest uh, VM to run it on. And it tried to give us like a high compute VM for some reason. Um, basically, all of these things kind of uh, led us to uh, want to explore something better. Um, so after kind of prompt engineering, whatever you want to call it, hacking away at ChatGPT, trying to get us, trying to get it to make something that would work for us, um, we decided to kind of look for better solutions. And so after searching around for a bit, um, we uh, discovered Terraform. We hadn't heard about it prior to starting this project. Um, and uh, I'm assuming you know, some of you have heard about Terraform, maybe some not. But um, Terraform was basically perfect for kind of the solution we were looking at for this project. And I'll go, go ahead and kind of explain a few reasons uh, for that here. Um, so if you don't know uh, what Terraform is, it's uh, essentially kind of an infrastructure as code um, kind of very readable uh, language that um, allows you to kind of interact with the cloud uh, through code that's really easy to interpret. Uh, it can be cloud stuff. It can be on-prem stuff. It works with Kubernetes as well. Um, and it's highly modularized. So it's kind of in these little bite-sized, reusable, independent pieces. 
um, that anyone can kind of make and upload for a bunch of different services. Um, and that makes it very digestible um, as data for an LLM as well, which we'll get to. Um, the second thing is that uh, there's just a ton of data in these things called Terraform registries. And there's also a ton of documentation and metadata along with that. Um, so uh, the, there's like Terraform registries that are specifically for like each of the three big clouds, uh, for a bunch of other services as well that have a ton of Terraform code samples in them. They also have a ton of documentation on the Terraform side and on the service side. Um, and metadata to go along with that. Terraform files have their own metadata in and around them, uh, a bunch of YAML files that are associated with uh, different Terraform samples. Basically, there's a ton of data here that would be really, really, really good to use all of. Um, and then Terraform is, of course, uh, kind of uh, very widespread. It has um, integrations with like the three major clouds, obviously AWS, Kubernetes, as I've been saying. But uh, we specifically started using it for this project for Google Cloud because the goal was to do our homework and where our homework was on Google Cloud. So here we are. Um, I'll pass it over to Max to explain some of the intro of Cloudweaver. Yeah, so we kind of figured out what we wanted to solve, what we wanted to do, and that led to the creation of Cloudweaver. And what Cloudweaver kind of was, it a very basic idea at starting out, was just a simple conversational tool to automate cloud deployments. You know, how could I talk to an LLM, get a cloud deployment out of it, and really make sure it was right? And we wanted Cloudweaver, we conducted a lot of user interviews, and what we kind of decided was we didn't just want that one back and forth you would get from like a Gemini or a ChatGPT. We really wanted Cloudweaver to converse with the user so they could be walked through kind of the creation of the project without just having code spit out at them. And that would not just help make sure it's right and it's kind of satisfying all their needs, but that it's also kind of really encapsulating everything the user wants and it kind of is going to give them less of a black box that you usually get when you know, you're interacting with a powerful LLM. And let me just give you really quickly a rundown of what Cloudweaver could do, then we'll get into a light example and dive a little more into the architecture. Cloudweaver is going to give you a ready to deploy lightweight GCP project file, so just one file that you'll be able to put on your desktop and deploy to create an entire GCP project. It's going to give you intelligent recommendations throughout the process, it's going to give you essential changes and the kind of additions, not just to make it right, but to make sure that your project is going to adhere to just the current Terraform best practices. Again, giving you the most robust, best kind of final product that you could want. And it's going to give you, again, the newest Terraform knowledge. We're going to have regular database updates. And so you're not going to be using out-of-date libraries or modules or anything like that that you might get from ChatGPT if you were going to ask it kind of the same thing to generate a cloud project. And yeah, that's kind of the high-level example. So now we'll get you in the weeds with the real live example and kind of show you what would happen if you were going to use Cloudweaver for your process. Oh, OK. Well, I tried. I was really hoping that button would work and then failed me. I think I can just play it like this. Either way. Oh, one moment. You oh. go over here okay. and you go here. Great. Technical difficulties. Okay, so open up Cloud Weaver is what you're going to be kind of greeted with. There's going to be two buttons. One is going to be the previous Terraform one. If you already have a Terraform project and you want to use our LLM wrapper to kind of enhance it, you could do that. But we think what most people would do would be start a new project. And that's going to be start from scratch, talk to the LLM, hey, I need to do this in GCP. I know what I want to do. I don't know exactly how to do it. You don't have the application, just like ChatGPT or Gemini, ask your question down here. Type it out. I'm pasting it. Save us all a little bit of time. And once you kind of do that, as you see, this is kind of a homework problem for us. You know, generate a cloud deployment. It needs three compute engines, like take into account scalability. It needs to allow HTTP traffic. Like it needs to all be in the same region, basic stuff. And you see here, again, no code. There's going to be a very basic outline of what it's going to build. The instances, the services, the tools, a brief description of what they do, and then breaking down the kind of thought process. Here's what I'm going to do for data flow in your project. Here's what I'm going to do for security. Here's what I'm going to do for logging. This is how I'm going to deal with the networking you mentioned. And again, it's going to include stuff you asked, but it's also going to include stuff you didn't ask. If it knows you need networking, maybe it knows that you're going to need some compute instances that you didn't specifically mention. It's going to take those into account. It's also going to give you, maybe if you have a little more experience with GCP and modules, it's going to give you some of the module code it's going to put in that you could look at as well. But again, it's a very high level approach. Here's what I'm putting in your project. This is what it does. And again, the feedback. Is this kind of what you're looking for? At every step of the way, what you're going to notice is that our LLM is going to ask, does this look OK? Do you want me to go ahead with this? If not, what are the problems with this? What would you like me to fix? And just giving you just 
again, that feedback, and it's not just this black box of, you know, here's the LLM, I'm talking to it, here's a bunch of code I'm getting back. And as you see, it's even addressing user feedback, it's going to address latency optimization, cost optimization, security enhancements, just all these things you didn't necessarily mention in the prompt, it's going to take into account in building your project. And that's what we really wanted, because that's what we would have loved for our classes when we were asking it to do these homeworks. What does it need? What does this homework need? Or what does this project need that we don't currently know about? Because our knowledge just isn't there. And as you can see, confirm the architecture. Yes. Do you want to generate improvements? This is something we really wanted to put in. What generate improvements is going to do is going to take this kind of English architecture up here, laying out the project. And it's going to make sure it adheres, not just that it's correct, but it adheres to the Terraform best practices. And if it needs to kind of add any little bullets in there, any instances to really make it just a robust, clean, efficient kind of project, that's what those improvements are going to do. And as you can see, it's going to generate these improvements. Again, it's all broken up. So you could kind of, if you're interested in a certain part of the project, like let's say improving security, you could just go to that section, see what it's going to do. And this is just going to be a really helpful view where you know what this code is going to represent. It's not just based off of the prompt you gave it. It's going to be based off this architecture generated. And you could kind of directly communicate with that rather than communicating with the code it would output. And this is going to be even better too. Again, feedback always. Do you confirm these improvements? You know, or is this good for a project? Or do you want me to change it a little bit? And another benefit of kind of these architectures is that this is what's going to be fed back into our engine to actually generate your code. So again, it's not just user query go to the LM, code out. It's going to be user query, building these very robust, detailed architecture of the project. And then that's going to be fed into the AI. And it can go line by line and build your Terraform project based off of this, which we think just, again, just really enhances just your trustworthiness in the AI. You really know what you're getting out of it. And you have a lot more trust in kind of it's accurate. And then we confirm these improvements. Architecture is all good. Now we're going to finally get into the code part of this whole conversation. It's going to generate the code. What this code's going to be, it's not going to be, it's going to be a little messy only because we didn't want it to look like code if you're looking at a document. We wanted it again to be broken up into kind of sections. So if you wanted to see what a specific part of the architecture was talking about, you can go to that section of the code. You can see the modules, you can see the instances in it. And if you just had a little better understanding for GCP, a little more experience, then you can actually go into the code yourself and see what each section is going to represent based on the architecture. And this is a good uh, kind of uh, reason to use Terraform too is that it's all modularized so you'll see in just a second all that the code is in these little pieces that you can understand uh, how each product kind of relates to each other, how they're talking to each other. It's readable by you and the AI for that reason basically. Absolutely. And you're going to get this code. It's going to take a little bit to generate a little more so than the other parts of the conversation. Something for us to maybe improve in the future. And you're going to get that. You're going to be able to look through it. And at the end, it's going to ask for your feedback again. It's going to say, do you want this code? Do you want me to make improvements? Do we want to go back to the drawing board completely? And once you do, you'll see at the very end, it's going to actually generate a file for you to download. And what that's going to do for you, so as you can see, here's your code. You can work with the code if you want. But if you confirm it, it's going to give you a file to download. And then, again, we wanted to make this accessible to everyone. So it's going to give you a 1 through 10 step guide on how to actually deploy this, all the way from starting your Google Cloud account, getting your credits, getting the Google Cloud SDK on your desktop, putting this file on the desktop, and then it's going to give you all the commands of like, this is how you run it, this is how you tear it down, this is how you, if you want to edit the code, this is how you update the project, here's how you create a service account if you want to do that, and you'll see when the yes, and here's kind of just those instructions. So we wanted to make sure that first time around, know nothing about code, you know start to finish exactly how to deploy and manage your kind of Google project. And that was just the whole point of this, to really make it accessible to everyone. And yeah, that's kind of just a demo of Cloudweaver, just at a high level. And now we're going to kind of go a little more in depth into the inner workings of Cloudweaver and how all these pieces kind of operate and fit together. So we're going to walk through uh, this diagram of kind of uh, basic three parts of uh, how we built Cloudweaver and kind of uh, how we got that power into it. Um, and uh, you'll see kind of just the three big pieces here, basically. The middle being the chat conversation you just saw, uh, the left side uh, being the database that will talk about exactly how that's set up and kind of uh, what the LLM is talking to as it talks back to you. Um, and then uh, what we do in terms of code generation and linting after uh, the conversation is over. Um, so first, uh, the Terraform database itself. Um, is essentially a database of a bunch of Terraform samples, documentation, and metadata, like I said earlier, um, in this case specifically for Google Cloud. Um, and one of the really, really powerful parts of this database is that it's essentially live. 
Um, it is a custom hierarchical database with a bunch of metadata in it that we kind of uh, generate into it or uh, have kind of systematically put into it uh, as the files are generated. And that allows us to grab uh, kind of the most recent snapshot of the GitHub Terraform registries for Google Cloud, pull those down, and put them into our database every like five minutes or so. And that makes it so that if anyone makes a change to a Terraform module or uploads a new Terraform module, for an example, this will know about it almost instantaneously. Um, and that's both really good for just kind of staying up to date with things. Obviously, that's great. Um, but that's really good for experienced devs, too, because if someone adds something, this is going to tell you about it. It's like if something's better than what you're currently using, uh, this might look for it. Um, and then uh, moving on to the actual user conversation that you just saw a piece of. Yeah, so we built this kind of database out, and we really wanted to leverage it. And one thing that we kind of got into a little problem with was we had all these different files in the kind of GitHub Google Docs database for all these different computances. We had main files, variable TF files. We had outputs, inputs. We had all this stuff, but we wanted one singular output from our LLM. We wanted one deployable file. And so what we kind of did to combat that was we used Langchain to build our ragchain. And specifically, our secret sauce is the self-querying kind of retriever. And what that does is not only does it give you an ability to obviously tag these files, say this is a main file, it's a variables file, it allows you to kind of define them for the LLM so that the LLM knows when it sees a main file and it reads through it. It knows where to kind of put that into its final output. And it knows kind of how to like, I guess the best way to think about it is like, here's the block that the main file should go into. Use that code to put it in there. So it's not just taking in all this code from all these different files and haphazardly trying to weave it all together into your final solution. It kind of builds it out the way that you envisioned it to kind of be built out. And it knows how to incorporate these files together into a single file rather than just using its own knowledge base for it, which was really helpful. And we immediately saw results where it actually was putting these files in the correct positions in the final output. And it wasn't kind of mixing things together and having these hallucinations that you would see with a kind of a more basic LLM without this, um, this retriever and this database attached to it. And one thing we didn't mention, because you couldn't see it in the live demo, was the actual kind of final code generation step. After you have that code and you confirm that it's what you're looking for, what we do is we put a linter through it. Again, we really wanted to make sure that this code was right and that kind of adhered to all the Terraform best practices, was up to date. And what this linter is going to do is once you have the final code and you give it the thumbs up to the LLM that I want to download this, it's going to run through the linter. What the linter is going to do, it's going to go line by line in your code. And if it's wrong, it's going to flag it. It's going to tell you the error in the line. And not only that, but it's going to tell you if it meets best practices. It'll say on line 22, this module should really be this, just based on my knowledge of the Terraform best practices. And then we're going to take all that feedback. We're going to take your code, and we're going to feed it back into the LLM so the LLM can go line by line, and it can actually make those changes. It could correct the code. It could make sure that that module is up to date. It could use the best version of whatever you're putting into your project. And it's really just that extra step to make sure that your solution is as good as it could possibly be. And it comes all together. We were able to really start seeing great results almost immediately when we hooked all these three things up. We don't have an actual metric to test this on yet, but even something basic is just taking the same prompt and putting it through our engine versus ChatGPT and Gemini. We were already starting to see that a lot of the hallucinations and wrong code that you were getting from ChatGPT and Gemini, our code wasn't outputting. The code would take into account modules that were necessary for this project to run that the other engines didn't get. And so we were already able to see that it was having that thought process it was incorporating this documented code a lot better than the basic models. And I think the coolest thing was we didn't mean to do this at the beginning. Our focus was narrow just on GCP and how could we generate Terraform. But we really quickly realized that we accidentally almost built a very adaptable architecture. And we're going to tell you a little bit about that right now. Yeah. And the nice thing about this, too, is it did successfully do our homework first try uh, when we asked it. To, there you go. Um, it, used the, it used the right cost for everything. It was great. Uh, it was really satisfying to see that done. It took us, like, you know, the homework was like a year old at that point, but we, we got it. Um, so uh, now we kind of move into what's next. And there are a few kind of like interesting ideas that uh, you can think about with this architecture that we made, both kind of within the Terraform and cloud space and just kind of with the uh, general structure itself. 
Um, so here are a few like other use cases um, that we've talked about that some people might be interested in as well. Um, it could obviously be used for cloud migrations. That's maybe what some of you have already thought about. That's kind of the most obvious one to jump to first uh, because it's a cloud tool with Terraform and it can obviously work very easily with the other clouds. Uh, you would just have to basically change your link to not uh, the Google documentation, but like the AWS Terraform documentation or the Azure Terraform documentation, all of which is very rich. Tons of documentation and metadata, same story. Um, moving on to obviously a bit, kind of like further out from that would require a bit more work of kind of messing with the database really, but uh, the other two pieces and kind of the self-querying retriever, the architecture we built around this would largely still work. Um, is if you ha were to make like a code base assistant or a document database assistant, um, simply because of uh, the power of the database updating regularly, that makes it so if you had an internal code base for a company or something and someone changed something, if you were uh, asking this generative assistant, it would know. Um, and also uh, because of how the self-querying retriever works and responds to the conversation, we can actually even show the files the LLM is using to think. So for example, if you're working on a code base and you're asking how you should do something, it will both explain to you like, oh, you know, this is how you would do something within this code base. Also, here are the files I'm using to think about that. So if you want to go check the sources for yourself and like just you know, think through it for yourself, here's where you're going to look. Um, and then finally, just uh, container orchestration, uh, things about like, if you want to manage five devices, or seven containers on five devices, like how should I do that? How, how can I um, make best use of my resources? What's that going to look like? Uh, what are different options I can go for? Like what would uh, kind of, what would the generic option be for this use case? Um, or, you know, determining like optimal container placement strategy, all of those sorts of things. And Sorry, if no, I might jump in at the code base assistant part, that's something we really wanted to do with our um, LLM and kind of this whole Cloud Weaver wrapper. And that's what I think it lends itself so great in settings like the code base assistant is that if you ask it to like say fix an issue in a code base, it's not going to give you the code. It's going to give you that English description. So you're going to be able to see these are the files it's taking into account and these are the parts of the code base it's looking at when it's formulating your solution. So you know that when it's going to write that solution, Right or wrong, at the first step, you're going to know, OK, it's looking at all the appropriate documentation, all the appropriate background that, let's say, a software engineer would look at if it was, they were going to try to solve the same issue or make the same changes. And I think that's incredibly important, because then you can make that kind of have that feedback as well, like, actually, that looks good, but I think you should look at this file as well, because this actually has a lot of the base code that you would use for the solution. And you give it that, and it just, you just make sure that you know what you're, kind of, you're getting when you get that final output from our LLM. I just wanted to add that in. No, that's fair. The, the caveat to that, of course, being like, this would be pretty easy simply because it's set up to ingest Terraform. But if you wanted to move to like a document database or a different code database, you would have to kind of restructure how it ingests the live data. Um, but the rest of the infrastructure would basically work as is um, because it's all kind of based on uh, the, database, da the database metadata. Um, so finally, um, just before we wrap up, um, a lot of people were, uh, interested in this, especially for kind of open source reasons, because there's a lot of people who uh, use Terraform um, for uh, like kind of open source on-prem things. Um, so we wanted to ensure that this could stay as open source as possible. Obviously, we're publishing everything we've done. Um, Langchain's all public. We can uh, make all the code public as well. Um, but uh, this was originally powered by Gemini because it was really easy for us to do that. It was in-house. We were already on GCP. You know, we weren't like thinking about open source. Um, but because of how we built it, uh, you can just swap the model out for anything that can code well. It doesn't, it's not really model specific. It doesn't really matter. Um, and so uh, we're basically building a kind of model swapper where you can just kind of choose what you want to interact with. Um, and obviously, we're probably going to not have like Gemini on there because we're not going to pay for that. Um, but um, And then the other thing, of course, is um, if you know, uh, uh, Terraform, you probably know that it is sort of not open source anymore because of the licensing change. Um, so uh, there's a open source fork of Terraform called OpenTofu um, that we are also going to migrate to uh, to make sure that this stays like as open source as possible. Um, and yeah, that's essentially it. Uh, thank you all for coming out and let us know if you have any questions. Um, so I'm curious, like, 
Can you talk a little bit about how you ingested the data and where it went and how you retrieved the data? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just, uh, that was by far the hardest part. Uh, that was the longest part, obviously. It was just like, you know, 80, 85% of this was just trying to mash the data into a format that made any sense to the LLM. Um, and so the, the other complicated part of it was that we really, really wanted it to be live. Like, we wanted it to be able to regenerate the database based on just like a few scripts that were kind of like running based on what it was pulling from GitHub. Um, so I couldn't just kind of make manual changes. I had to make them in script form and make sure it would be able to automate everything. Um, so it basically goes uh, to uh, a set list of um, all of the major Google Cloud services. And it goes to all of their GitHub pages, downloads all of their files, and then sorts them based on a bunch of different parameters. Um, it deletes a ton of files that it doesn't need. It merges a bunch of files that the LLM would much rather see as one thing. Um, it adds, like, it, when it completes a file, it kind of like tags it at the top with what it is, what you can do with it, how it should be used. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of the power is coming from here is like, there's not only, not only is Terraform kind of self-explanatory in a lot of ways, you can kind of look at it and see what it does. Uh, we also have just a bunch, a bunch of documentation explaining exactly what you, what it should do, where it should be, and why. Yeah. Um, did that answer, Roger? Do you want to say some? Yeah, I was going to say, we, as George mentioned, we do have documentation. We have a bunch of readme files in there too, and that's kind of a strength. The L, or the L, excuse me, the self query retriever as well is we can put those readmes in right alongside the code and say. Don't use this text to actually build out your code solution, but look at it because this is going to be documentation that's going to explain how to fit these pieces together, which would really lend itself to an evolution in the future with the way we built the chain of if we want to put code in there or want to put sorry documentation in there that's not code that we want to still use to kind of formulate that final answer, we could know that we could put it in there and say, don't use this to generate, just use this to learn. I just wanted to add that. Great job. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll add, I'll add while you transfer. The last other really nice piece of that is that all of the Terraform modules have documentation alongside the code. Like it's just a separate file. It has a bunch of information about it, and they're all in there. So you can basically just tell the LLM, look in that folder and see what else you see. Um, so it's great. Thanks. I think this is super cool. Um, but you've mentioned that you will be publishing the, the documentation. You have lots of documentation. Uh, where do we go to follow that as it comes out? Good question. That's a, good, that's a very good question. Um, right now, it currently lives on Replit. We definitely want to migrate, migrate it out of that. Um, probably at the same time, we move the LLM from Gemini to something like Llama or maybe the Granite models. But right now, it's just something on Replit you could search and then fork on your own machine. And then you would be able to go through a live example just like the one we showed. But right now, it's not actually published to like a URL. That you'd be we're hoping, yeah, we're just hoping to like web post it. We yeah. just graduated, so we have like no money to host it at all. Um, but uh, hopefully, it will uh, eventually be essentially free to set up anyways. And then we'll have it kind of live hosted. OK, so you don't have a GitHub repo or anything? We like do. That. We do. Yes. Um, I actually, I'll put that on the board right now. Yeah. I should have put, I should have done that. It's a question. And the replay. Too. I just uh, want to say it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I heard your idea like six months ago because um, you were, are you a senior this year? I graduated. graduated. I'm, I'm pursuing a master's in, in like a month. Amazing. Yeah. They um, both. <laughs> I'm bragging. They were both students of my of Irvishi and mine. We teach a course at BU, and amazing. And I was going to ask about the GitHub repo yeah. and if we could start uh, contributing. I can't uh, believe how far it's come. How about just that? That'll do. Hi. Thank you for this. Um, I just have a question on the latency that we saw in the code generation step. Yeah. Um, do you know where the latency is coming from? Is it like the database? Is it the post generation? Like, what's going on? I think I don't think it's the database. I think it's really it's the code generation step, and it's just accessing all of those files. I think. That step from what we've did from just our testing accesses by far the most documentation through the self querying retriever. So I think that's something that's just kind of catching it a little bit, giving you that extra 20, 25 seconds of runtime. And that's something else we would definitely think that we could pretty easily kind of shorten down once we get to it. But to answer your question, I can't say 100% what it is. Cool. Thank you.
So I'm just wondering, you didn't mention anything about using agents, but are you actually using agents? Because agents are really good in terms of you know, all the flow that you're going to be needing to do your, your stuff, right? So I'm curious, too. Um, short answer, no. It's actually really funny you say that, because I feel like I started seeing agents all over my email in the news um, just, just after, after we graduated. graduated. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So absolutely, if we'd started this um, two months ago, I'd say absolutely we would have used Agent for this. But no, and when we started doing this project, I just didn't know too much about this technology or agents in general, so we didn't incorporate and that. And to be fair, in Langchain behind the scenes, some of what's happening is agent fair, yeah. it's it's it wasn't called that, like you know, called that a month later. But it, a lot of what's happening behind the scenes is kind of instructed in, in that same way. So yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in some in, in a way. <laughs> and curious too, which uh, vector database did you are you using? Just curious. So uh, Neo4j was oh, okay. um, kind of the the initial setup for kind of relating everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I think this gentleman up here. Sorry, make you run. <laughs> Oh, this is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you may have already said this, but yeah, when did you start this uh, project? Uh, and yeah, when, when did you start this project? And is this uh, using a gener Is this using a GP a GPT or is it using? Yeah, is is it using a pre-trained transformer? Yeah, it's using Gemini as the base. We started it, let's say, mid February because we had to get up and running with the class, and I think it finished up just at the end of April. So really short time frame. <laughs> Nice. It's awesome. Great show. Do we have any other questions in the house? OK. Uh, how often do you guys see failures? When developing, like, when developing this, basically? No, I mean like. From the outputs? Yeah, just throughout the pipeline. So like, surprisingly, not that often. And that's largely because of how much we've restricted it. Like that's, we can do that because we're only talking about GCP and because we're only talking about like Terraform, like on cloud developments. A lot of the mistakes it tries to make are cut out during the linting step when it kind of tries to check over itself because the, the kind of, the, the documents are retrieving, it's really not retrieving a lot of Terraform code. And so it, it, during the linting step, if it's not generating something it looked at, it's basically going to throw it out and say that it probably shouldn't be there because it might be a hallucination. So because we cross-reference it so hard with actual Terraform code that exists, it's much more often that it does a little more than it needs to uh, in most cases is what we found it doing. Like, for example, for our homework, like what we really, really needed was the cheapest VM with like one script on it and like this most simple cloud SQL database. But kind of the, I feel like it's part of the problem with that is that there's not a lot of information about how to do that out there because it's not that hard. Um, so a lot of the things that I feel like it was trained on were like a bunch of extra stuff, like add a load balancer, add this, add that. It's for a business. It's do this. It's do this. Um, and so I feel like when it's making kind of mistakes, it's that it's doing too much. Um, it's that it's adding things it doesn't need to. And specifically, sorry, especially, especially for the code part, um, one thing we figured out, obviously, with using ChatGPT is if you have this code and you say fix this, sometimes its head explodes and it'll change half the code. And you're like, oh my god, it's ruined. Um, so what we do kind of in the lane chain, it allows you to kind of build the chain out, put the inputs and outputs at each step of the conversation and really structure it how you want. And so what we do is it has the code. It makes the feedback and changes. It has that changed code. And then it directly compares it with the original code. It just kind of brings it down and cross-references to make sure. And it goes line by line and says, like, go line by line from the original code to the new code. Were any of these changes unnecessary? And we kind of found that just that addition really helped it kind of remove a lot of those hallucinations and failures and really made sure that like what was going to be changed in the code was actually what you asked for. And it wasn't all this kind of other unnecessary stuff. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, do we have any other questions still? One for me. Oh. There you go. Uh, so folks, you told that you intended to make uh, somewhat a live database of all the configurations created with Cloud Weaver. Are those easily accessible? I mean, like, if I have any kind of malicious intent 
I would be easily gathering the configuration of all virtual machines in cloud. Whenever a person oh, oh, it's them. just um, it's all of so all of the uh, stuff we're pulling is public. Like it's all accessible on GitHub. Uh, it's um, always accessible. So like, yeah, it's n none of the none of the code it's generating or like deployments it's making. None of the secrets are are like public or anything. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about even using Terraform is that you could actually use Terraform has its own secret storage vault. Um, so you can actually even use that uh, to do secret storage outside of the clouds you're using itself separately. Um, so you'd never have to like even go off platform to store secrets. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? What are you guys actually storing in the database? Uh, it is on my laptop. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, like, what, what's in the database? Um, so it's uh, basically a bunch of uh, Terraform files, uh, which are just like a bunch of you know, .tf files that are you know, text files with all the modules. And then um, those are coupled. Um, they're kind of like basically in the same location with a bunch of the documentation and metadata about how to use those files. Um, like you know how they were set up, how they were made, where they're from, um, what they can relate to, uh, and then there's it's it, it kind of depends per product actually uh, more than that because there are a lot of different services that all need to interact with Terraform in different ways, and so in order for the LLM to understand how it can interact with different services, we actually like custom set up different services in different ways. Um, to make sure that it could uh, get a full understanding of everything, especially like the big databases and like uh, other uh, orchestration tools were much larger than just something like um, a, load, a load balancer, for example. Nice. I just have one comment. Okay, we have a comment. Okay, the next session starts in three minutes. Okay, oh. I just wanted to say like what Kelsey said yesterday about supporting independent developers. This is the perfect example of how this could be really cool. Like if there was Patreon and a GitHub page that we, people could. Is, is there something like that, like Patreon for GitHub? I feel like we should start that so that people can <laughs> contribute. Yeah. Oh, please buy me a coffee. Yeah, but please buy me a database. <laughs> <laughs> so follow-up question on the data, though. Where are you guys sourcing it from? It's from the Google just official GitHub documentation for Terraform. I see. There's, there's both. Um, like Google has documentation, obviously, for its own services, which we pull in. But then Terraform Registries has its own documentation for how the Terraform interacts with those Google services. And we draw all of that in. So it has a full understanding of both the actual service itself within Google Cloud and how Terraform interacts with it. Very cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you.